Good evening, ghouls and goblins and all things that go bump in the night. From the deep and dark recesses of your mind, we're taking a journey to something truly horrific and disgusting. That's right, it's the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. Every week, we bring on an industry guest, or in this case, two, uh, to talk about the ever-expanding Geekoverse. We do our damnedest to be funny, or scary, or disgusting, but there are no guarantees. I am your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me on this episode is my vampire-like parasite, Mike Kafis. I smell your soul, smell your soul! <laughs> and on this special Halloween uh, episode, we are welcoming Paul Ellard Cooley. Oh, look at this, I'm, I'm not even able to, I'm not, I can't even talk into the talk. <laughs> Paul, welcome. <laughs> I've only done this like a thousand fucking times. And Phil Rossi. (laughs) So uh, they are returning guests. If you've ever watched this show more than a few times, you probably have seen one of these two on the show. And we're happy to have them back. Um, We want to do a Halloween special this year. And I couldn't think of two better folks to have on to talk about horror writing than these two. I listen to their horror stories on a regular basis. And... uh, um, I, I, I'm definitely excited to talk to them. But real quick, uh, Paul Cooley is an author and podcaster who produces sci-fi, suspense, and thriller fiction. Thriller! And essays. His best-selling novel, The Black, was released in 2014 and won the 2015 Parsec Award for long-form fiction. Since then, he has published six novels. I think it's six. This is when I grabbed the bio. It might be more. Uh, <laughs> both in the urban fantasy and hard sci-fi genre, including the Derelict Saga, as well as... Oh, wait a minute. Three sequels to The Black now, right? Oh. Yeah. 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 Three. Three and... for him right now. So, yeah, book four. Uh, and it's and it's just starting to get really meaty. <laughs> when we're finally going to die, right? Yeah, I'm hoping. I thought we were. I don't know. I haven't seen us. I don't think we you are. You guys are not in book four. No, we didn't make it, Mike. We didn't make the cut. <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, I had to push off those two characters until book five. All right. All right. Book five. That's yeah, so now we're being immortalized. Yes. <laughs> Is that what we're calling it? Okay, then. At least introduced us. You know, had people who really wanted to be endeared to our characters before we... <laughs> Go with that. Anyway, with Phil that. Rossi is an author, podcaster, musician, and Twitch streamer. He has been podcasting since 2006, releasing his debut sci-fi horror podcast novel, Crescent, in 2007 to much acclaim. Since then, Phil has gone on to write and podcast many stories that keep people up at night. I try. Yeah, fantastic. I try. So, keeps me up at night. <laughs> so, so the, the goal tonight is uh, we're going to talk about writing horror. So... Um, because I, there's a there's a very specific skill set to that because not all horror is equal. Um, you know, you watch some horror movies or read horror books, and some things just miss the mark, or some things are just so like disturbing and weird. Um, you know, so so there is a real talent to it. Um, so I, I wanted to reach out to you guys and see what your thoughts were on it, being that you write a bunch of horror stuff. Um, and and Cooley, what would you say? You know. Do you write like there's these all these different ways to describe the genre of horror? You know, there's there's like Clive Barker kind of writes actiony horror. Like his stuff is like sort of like a horror themed thriller kind of actiony stuff. Like like um, what was that movie? Depends uh, on which one you're reading. Yeah, uh, what, what Depends was that movie? On what that you're reading. I watched it. His it was um, Nightbreed. Uh, yeah, uh, the book I think is called Cabal. Yeah, okay. well, I think it was in like, and when I read it, it was in like, it was almost a, it's a novella. Or no. It was the, yeah. like the books of blood and then the Cabal was in one of the books of blood series that Clive Barker put out. Yeah. So, so what yeah, do you, that one had action. No, what would you, what would you say action. that you, you write mostly Paul? Like what kind of, um, what, what is your, your type of horror that you write? I love suspense. I love making you know something very bad is around the corner and not letting the character know about it or, you know, having things just kind of go to hell over a slow period of time. And then when they finally do, it goes all in a rush because you spent the entire time setting up all the cards to fall. Right. So it's the slow burn. It's really what I like the most. I mean, you think about alien, for instance, 
we don't see the creature until like the end, really. Yeah. And it's all about the fact that it is amorphous and doesn't really uh, uh, match up to anything. It's all left to the imagination. Right. And that, that, that is a really big reason why that story works so well. Yeah. That's the kind of horror I like to write. Okay. Smell. The, you, the smell is what gets you, too. How you start describing things that smell, and you're just like, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? going to be anywhere near it. <laughs> Okay. Smell and sound are very, very important triggers because you can use them in darkness. You can use them when you're blind. You can use them in all sorts of fashions. And the best part of it is, if you do it right, the reader is right there with it. Yeah, and you know, with yeah. memory being tied so strongly with smell... And sometimes I, I think I remember reading somewhere that imagining something in your mind sometimes is the same as doing it. Like it triggers the same area of the brain. So Paul, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you're triggering people to remember your stuff more by putting smells oh. in there. You know, maybe that's mm, subliminal. I hope. Right? <laughs> Scratch and sniff. Yeah. Uh, Ed, Lord, Ed Lauren like said I ruined <laughs> the smell of frying bacon for yeah. him. That now it's no longer is salivating. So. Hey, tell him you're going to make a scratch and sniff black. And then he'll. <laughs> oh, God. You know what? You know what? You should say instead of crackling bacon, it should be cr uh, crackling scrapple. Because oh yes, who the fuck scrapple, right? Who the fuck likes scrapple anyway? I don't like scrapple. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't hate scrapple. <laughs> uh, there. there you go, Mike. In your face. I just don't I'm not anti scrapple. Yeah. <laughs> oh, see, Mike, you're losing ground. All right, so Phil, oh, what are you writing? Right. What well, you know, I think very much uh, same same wheelhouse as as Paul. I'm a big fan of of the slow burn and kind of I'm a, I don't want to say teasing, but you're kind of activating subtly these these trigger points as you're leading your uh, your readers or your listeners down the sort of uh, metaphorical long dark hallway. I mean, I think that's I was having a conversation with someone, or maybe it came up on one of my Twitch streams that. That long dark hallway is always gonna scare you, even if you 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 don't know what's down that hallway. You don't, and it could be nothing, but it's still that it's it's gonna scare you because every step, every step could bring something coming rushing at you. And uh, the slow burn again, I agree with Paul. I feel like for me, that's what I like to read. That's what I like to watch. For me, that's where it's at. I like to have my imagination roll in and just feel my kind of heart rate steadily getting there and then kind of keen back and that pace of sort of you, you get feel like you're getting somewhere and you're about something's about to happen and then nothing much happens or just enough happens that you're like oh shit it when big thing would something's coming and right. if it's this bad now i don't even want to i don't even want to get there right. and in then, the chapter yeah, exactly <laughs> bingo and then, and then everything just, then it all happens. You, hell in a handbasket, right? It, it, then, then it peaks really fast. It's almost too much to handle. And then it kind of leaves you at that sort of like, what the, what the F just happened? Something happened and it was uncomfortable and it was unpleasant. And I'm going to be thinking about it about an hour from now when I'm laying in bed at night, the whole journey. And then, the, and, and that's for me, that's what I like to write. And, and I like to, to leave that, uh, the door open for the imagination to, to really kind of torment the reader. <laughs> right. <laughs> for lack right. of a better word. Absolutely. But here's the thing before, before I let you ask the question, because that's what I do to myself. And I think that's kind of integral to at least my, how I write horror and why you, know, you guys think, and others have said that I, I, I seem to know what I'm doing. It's because at the end of the day, and I, I'm not ashamed to admit this, I'm a huge chicken. I am scared to, I get scared to death fairly, fairly, not easily, but scary shit scares the shit out of me. And, and so that's, I feel like knowing what that feels like and knowing what gets me going is, is, is how I tend to approach my writing. Yeah. So let's talk about horror and suspense because there's a genre of movies and books called suspense and it's not horror. So I think, is it safe to say that all Horror contains suspense. It, it is an, uh, an important element. Or no, not all horror mm -hmm. contains suspense. Okay. All right, well, well, then, all right. Well, let me, let me finish my question before you tear it apart. Then, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it can you then also say that all or suspense? There is suspense 
that has to have some elements of horror. I wanted to talk about basically this separation of horror and suspense, or is there? Because to me, it, I feel like you can have suspense and a movie full of suspenseful things that are just not very horror you know right. what I mean? As opposed to, you know, you got a horror movie and there's suspense and like, I'm like, you know, either just cringing or grabbing a part of my body that I don't want to be subjected to whatever is happening. Is I, I, I would say, <laughs> I, I would say that basically you're thinking about the wrong way. It's more along the lines of, um, if we follow this metaphor and hopefully I won't crash it too bad, but if you're making a dish, right? You're going to have steak, you're going to have roast beef, chicken, whatever, you know, the base is. You're going to have your veggies, you're going to have add-ons and everything else. That's the story, more or less. Mm -hmm. For horror, you're basically sprinkling on a lot of grotesqueries or things to make people just kind of shudder, shiver a little bit, and you're sprinkling that on there. In suspense, it's not sprinkled on. It is baked in. It is underneath. It is on every freaking layer of the dish because it's designed from the ground up to have that. Horror is not really a genre in my estimation. It is more of a style of storytelling. It is more along the lines of it's going for visceral reactions from the reader. That doesn't always mean there has to be blood and guts, but it's mm -hmm. going for a visceral reaction. That's horror. Suspense is... You get the tingles because you don't want to go around that corner. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I, I like that. More, and, and terror is mixing the two together and, and just really having a good time. Yeah, and and I think and I think terror is definitely as I mean that's terror is a big part of horror, right? But terror is not necessarily part of suspense. But uh, you know, you might be. I mean, suspense could be. Oh my gosh, are they going to cut the right wire when they disarm yeah. this bomb? Right. Mm -hmm. It's where you cut to a commercial or where people like <laughs> Phil and I end a chapter. That's, that's, you know, that's, There's that's a suspense part. element, right? Yeah, exactly. that's part of it. Yeah. Suspense is waiting a chapter and finding out they finally cut the right wire. Horror is <laughs> waiting a chapter and finding out they cut the wrong wire. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, oh. that's, no, that's just my style of story. Uh, <laughs> no, Mike, horror, horror is, horror is when the three-year-old crawls over and licks the blood up from the explosion. <laughs> yes that would do it yeah, yeah that was good yeah. that was good i'll yeah. write that yeah. shit down right now there you Green, go so, all right so guys would you consider all right look here's a straight up question <laughs> would you consider <laughs> isolation as maybe the prime element of a good horror or suspense story like i've always felt that isolation is probably I don't know, maybe the most important piece of a good like scare the fuck out of somebody kind of story. I love isolation as an element. Um and it's a great it's a great narrative tool, certainly, and there's so much you can do with isolation. Um I also think though that it can be equally terrifying, if not more, if if you remove that element of isolation and these horrible, terrifying things are happening to people that, you know, I, it's, for example, um, and it's still sitting on my shelf gathering dust, but, you know, I wrote a, um, it's, I, it's a suburban, you know, horror novel, right? And it happens in a neighborhood that is, you know, cookie cutter kind of neighborhood, right? But it's, it's, there's, you know, that sense of isolation is never really omnipresent. There's always someone right across the street with their lights on or someone doing this, or the kids are downstairs playing video games. Uh, for me, um, I love isolation, but I often think that um, if you even, I mean, how much, how many of us really experience the kind of isolation in day to day life that people do in some of these great stories? I mean, alien isolation, and there is alien isolation as well. Oh, uh, right? yeah. I, was well, just I mean, the isolation that. in Alien is great. The isolation, The Shining is great. You know, some of the newer stuff, um, like The Ritual on Netflix, I really I enjoyed. Mm -hmm that uh there's a um black spot a french uh series kind of more like less horror more suspense but again they're small like french village that's great sometimes it's hard for people i think to relate to that but if you can put people in in a in a scene or a book or whatever where you're removing the comfort of how that's what i'm trying to get to you remove 
the comfort that you find in having people around. Right. And I think, I think, um, and I know I'm hardly answering your question, um, <laughs> but you remove the comfort of having people close by your wife upstairs, your neighbors next door, uh, the crowded dorm or whatever, the hotel. I think that can be even, even scarier. So while I think isolation is a beautiful narrative tool and I often use it myself, I don't necessarily feel like that's a, that's a prime element. Okay. Long it's a way prime, short answer. <laughs> it's pri it's a prime element for certain kind of stories. Yeah. Um, the uh, a bottle story is essentially where you take all the characters, you throw them into a bottle, you shake it up, <laughs> add some acid and explosives, throw it up in the air, and see what happens. Uh, I like to write those. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. You know, I've written. Uh, well, there will be five books in derelict, which is essentially how can you get more isolated than space? Oh, I don't know, underwater or out on a rig. Right. Uh, <laughs> that those are fertile places for that isolation. Like it, like like Phil's saying, especially if you're writing creature stories, where you know you kind of need a way to hit the hell away from it. Otherwise, the story's mm -hmm. over. Damn it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> you know, finding ways to bottle people up is is fantastic for suspense. It really does work for horror, too, because mm -hmm. you're basically locking the folks in. But the horror Phil's talking about is is uh, very interesting, too, which is uh, a sense of a loss of reality. For instance, if I'm walking through Phil's cookie-cutter neighborhood and I happen to look over at a house and I see a shape behind the drapes and it's turning to watch me as I go past... That might creep me out a little bit. Am I going to talk to anybody about that? No. I'll sound insane. I go the next night, I see four more like that. And these are neighbors I don't know. And the next night, there are 10. Uh, I'm getting chills just thinking about that. There's just something about that kind of horror that just works no matter where you are. And or like you said, you don't have to be bought. Or did we mention that um, you know, no one has lived in that house for about six or eight months because you know they're uh, overseas on contract with the military and the house is you know hasn't had renters in months and months and months and and now you're seeing someone standing in the window. Right. Right. Yep. There's another one. Yeah. It's the <laughs> uncanny. It's it's taking the familiar and making and weirding it, making yep, it absolutely making it creep you out as opposed to to make it comforting. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I guess yeah I guess you're just, so like for example for like let's take a classic poltergeist, right? They could have left the house any time. Oh, yeah. They did. Right, they did, right, yeah. And <laughs> I'm just saying, they, they weren't, they weren't tra the only thing that was trapping them there is getting their daughter back. But they were not, that doesn't take place, in, like you said, like in a bottle. There's people coming and going. Mm -hmm. uh, the Exorcist is another example where that's wide open. People can come and go, you know, they... I guess they could have just left her there, but <laughs> that would make for a good story. They should have. Yeah, I know, right? That entire room where she's at is a bottle. That yeah. is the bottle that is, for the story. Yes, absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, all right. So, what, Mike, you look like you want to say something. You got that well, look on your face. Like, <laughs> or you have to part. Thinking of that, that stupid commercial <laughs> you just I, you know. did. <laughs> I was thinking of that stupid commercial you guys know where the, the, all those kids are like, you know, like, oh, what are we going to do? And it's like, well, the one girl's like, why can't we get in that runny car over there? <laughs> right. And oh, yeah, yeah, right. No, yeah, let's hide behind the chainsaws. <laughs> Yeah, that Geico commercial is awesome. Terry Mixon wants me to write that story from the serial killer's <laughs> point of view. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Right. But yeah. That is that would be good. All right. So anyway, hey, so we do have a question from the chat room. We got uh, Michael Thompson's Ooh. asking for Paul or Phil uh, favorite Lovecraft story. Hmm, that's tough. While you think about that, I just I've never read Lovecraft. I just bought his complete like Ooh. omnibus and I go on audiobook and I'm getting ready to list, start listening to it tomorrow morning. Cool. So it's like like you said, fix that shit, right? So I'm fixing it. I finally it was like I gotta keep everybody talks about it all the time. But yeah, what's what do you think? That's a tough I, I, I always have such a hard time with the uh with the favorite question. I choke on it, and uh, I, I choke on it. So I'm going to let Paul answer that first. <laughs> like, I'm the guy that likes to order last. <laughs> uh, I think it's kind of between Call of Cthulhu and the uh, color from out of, outer space. Okay. Um, 
Both, both of which, by the way, have been made into fine little indie films. Um, I think yeah. you can find them on Netflix. They're actually pretty decent for what they are. Um, but uh, those are the two stories because they have that creepy feel. I mean, we never really see anything necessarily nasty in, in either of them, but we do. Yeah, I think that's a good way. I, 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 and again, like, you, like we've said before, it's often what is left to the imagination and I, I i think as just those two examples too it's just that sense of the the old evil is always very attractive to me or the unknown evil, yeah. right yeah well that is actually a great segue to my next question because it, it ties into uh in the the unknown aspect of horror so it's the unknown is another cornerstone of horror right um in, in your all's writing how do you decide what you're going to keep unknown and what you're going to reveal like mm -hmm. because you know sometimes some of the movies you see or books you read where they tell you too much about the creature or whatever or, or whatever it is that's scary it takes away some of the scary like it's, yeah, you're it's almost disappointed you're like, yeah oh, it's like, i don't really need to know that like, i didn't even know that or i didn't, I didn't want to know that yet I, as far as me i'm always less is more and again as we were both saying earlier uh I think the best burn is the slow burn. And so I reveal only as much as I feel will <laughs> allow the reader to at least feel that they're working towards, that there's going to be a payoff eventually. Um, I tend to try to reveal uh, just enough that more questions are raised, if that makes any sense. Uh, so the reader is always thinking, um and sometimes even even misled um but again less is more is always my philosophy and then everything just happens pretty rapidly once that fuse gets down to the little nub right that's just my, that's that's my my take on it paul i cheated <laughs> <laughs> well no surprise there <laughs> well i mean i cheated with the black that is the easiest freaking monster creature whatever you want to call it that you could possibly want to play with because it can be anything and mm -hmm. nothing well and i can relate because you i mean even with 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 crescent you know you in the yeah. end yeah and there will be more payoff and i and i have told people that the sequel is something that's going that is going to happen um but again and i think when you are working with this you know sort of ethereal kind of horror this it's a presence right it's it's i think that in a way you can kind of cheat it a little bit but then you, you also i think even as you feel like you're cheating um, <laughs> you've got to also know where you're going with it or else you're kind of painting yourself into into a corner as well that's not to say that i'm maybe i am in a corner you'll never know <laughs> <laughs> so, so, i wrote myself into a hell of a corner so, so, i've written myself out of it Talk about like, um, you know, effective horror stories. So I have a, a cousin of mine who is terrified of rats. And one of the reasons why he's terrified of rats is because in his mind, he read a story in the paper about a woman who kept hearing scratching in the walls. And ultimately, the story evolves to they find her, her carcass like in a, in a chair and the rats had broken through and, and eaten her. And I haven't read it yet, but I'm, but I'm like, I told him, I was like, Mark, I think, I think you read rats in the walls by hp lovecraft i don't think that was a newspaper article i i if i remember somebody tell me correctly i think you might be terrified of a horror story so yes so, yes yeah, so when i read this when I, when I get done reading this i'm gonna buy him a copy of rats in the walls i'm gonna give it to him and say here's that newspaper article that you're terrified of yeah nice. <laughs> so. it's from the 1930s right exactly exactly <laughs> All right, so you guys talk about slow reveal and how important it is to tension building, which is true, absolutely. Um, so what do, you, what do you guys do to keep readers engaged? Like, how do you, you know, if you, like Paul, I mean, so Paul, you, your slow burn can be really long. Like I know um, uh, in, in like Derelict, right? I think almost the whole first book is pretty, you know, it's pretty like just it's them Marines doing their things. Up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> how do you, how do you, what tricks do you use to keep people like people are like, where's the horror? I'm with the horror. I want the horror. But keep them like, keep them on the hook until it comes till the payoff. Hopefully giving them enough, uh, little creepy breadcrumbs to kind of keep them thinking and interested in, in what's going on. I have to introduce, uh, uh, things for the characters to do because learning about a world is always, uh, you know, part of the, um, the pleasure of science fiction 
So basically revealing some of those details, I probably could have cut that book by a 10% and been okay. Right. And if, wait, <laughs> if ever gonna... I release it again, I think I probably will. <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell you what I think Paul does also that um, helps with some of that slow burn is you are revealing some uh, some hard science, which me as a reader is trying to use to put clues together. Whether you know that you're doing that or not, maybe I'm just stupid and gullible. Maybe I'm no, not a representative that, sample, but <laughs> that, that's we'll part, that's part right. of it. Yeah. I mean, when, when you're when you're telling a creature feature and and you're 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 into the hard sci-fi and you you want to talk about these yeah. things, you want to give some basis for your imagination. Right. Yeah. Now, unlike Sigler, I cheated like a motherfucker because the black cannot be measured. It cannot be you know really. There's just not much you can do with it. All you can really do is observe. And so I can just keep piling on those observations until we finally get to what's going to happen in book five. Mm. But I've hinted at things and I've let the, the readers know that occasionally we're going to get thoughts from these things and that will make thing, life very interesting. Yeah, Paul, you've been, you've been putting a little bit of personality on this thing all of a sudden. Something in it. Yeah. The... Might have something to do with the name of the book. I don't know. What what was the name of this one? Evolution. Evolution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's J Jig. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, breadcrumbs definitely um, for me too, as far as to keep the readers engaged. Uh, you know, it's working on characterization, making the uh, you know characters. <laughs> Characters they get attached to, uh, for and making them characters that I get attached to because I'm not gonna have a great time, <laughs> right, Cat? Uh, I'm not gonna have a great time um, writing about characters that I don't feel particularly uh, emotionally invested. And of course, you've got your throwaway characters; everyone throws those in, so you can throw them into the meat grinder and not feel too terrible about it. Right? <laughs> um, at least, in, at least at the outset, when they're the bloody breadcrumbs that are are keeping people going. But um. Right. Yeah, definitely for me, you know, like what the characters have got going on, but also, you know, the relatable uh, emotions, even in even in a space station and, you know, on the edge of the frontier, I try to, you know, it's make the characters and, and what they're experiencing. Maybe that's not necessarily a direct part of the uh, whatever the action is, uh, the main storyline, but at least uh, relatable to those of us that are, you know, sitting on this planet, not on the edge of space. And I right. think that helps. Hopefully. I mean, again, you know, and I always say this and, and it's, you know, I, I really do feel like I wing it when I, when I sit down and write these books. Um, but again, you know, I, I try to write along the lines of the things that have kept me, you know, interested over the years. And sometimes that's, you know, most times that's unconscious, but I, you know, I, I read as much as I can too. And I, I hope that's the, the things that engage me. A lot of that is, is the character development and becoming oh, yeah. attached to these characters. And then you throw in the breadcrumbs and, and a little bit of, you know, tease out some explanation of something here, and then you kind of feel like you are working towards something. And at the end, you better hope that you know what you have been promising with these breadcrumbs is is a good hearty uh, hearty meal, right? Yeah. Or at least some good sex. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Either that, or someone's like, "No, never mind," and then you're like, "No, you're going to eat this." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably won't have a second date after that. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, that that that's just bad. And then the three year old horror, horror comes and over and don't horror and suspense don't really work with all that well if you don't have characters that you like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and I think that's a great. That's an absolutely great point. I, there, yeah, I, there's. I've experienced some exceptions with that. The ritual. I don't know if you guys watched that. I didn't yeah. really like the characters. Oh, but the creature. I fucking love the creature. <laughs> That was that was my that was my meal. You know, I didn't I didn't care if everyone got sliced and diced. You know, fuck them. But the creature was pretty special. Yeah, I'll that take, was a good. That was a good. Yeah. The, the movie. Have you, have you guys seen Mandy yet? Have you seen that yet? I haven't. I haven't. It's on my watch list. You I'm gotta a you gotta watch this movie. So forever. like the best character of the movie is the movie, right? That's yeah. the 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 scene. Huh? Like no, so. There are no characters that I like in the movie. Like I don't give a fuck about any of the characters in the movie, right? Uh, Nick, because I'm not a big Nicolas Cage fan anyway, and he plays Nicolas Cage. He play, you know, he's whatever. The movie itself is awesome. There's the cinematography, the 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 crazy trippy shit they do in the movie. Like it's just a pleasure to watch whatever the fuck is going on, going on. It's it's one of those. It's like 
this would be a good movie. This might be a good movie to maybe partake in a, a substance of some kind to watch. I, I didn't, but I, what do you I mean? I might understand what's like, it? like water, soda, Tylenol. Yeah, yeah, like like maybe maybe too many Advils. <laughs> but yeah, it was nothing. it was pretty wild. It was a wild movie. Yeah, but definitely again, worth the watch. I do feel like that is more of an exception um, because I've also watched other read other stories where the characters are flat or not particularly anything that you relate to or like about them. And here's the thing too, even a character has to evoke some kind of emotion in you, at least the, the, the sort of the main cast and it could be a, the villain uh, inspires some negative feelings in you. You just, you know, have this sort of great dislike of them. Um, hatred even maybe it doesn't have to be a positive emotion, but it's, it's gotta, it's gotta, it's gotta play those heartstrings somehow oh when when paul riser gets it in aliens you just you're just like yes, <laughs> yes. so uh, I, it, I, it, I, interesting not, note oh. interesting note uh in the uh anthology that uh scott is in right uh, the alien one there is a story that starts there oh Ooh. oh shit that's okay. all i'm gonna say that's that all right all i'm gonna say so hmm. nice i will say this when uh, I showed my um, my oldest daughter, we watched Aliens uh, together last summer. It was her first time seeing it, and man, she was she was pumped when he got his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we all. It was, it was nice to watch. Yeah. <laughs> such, yeah. such a well written because it's not just a throw. He's not just a throwaway character. Like you oh, love oh, yeah. to hate him. Like it's yeah. it's very genuine, and the payoff on him getting it is so good. Uh, and you don't feel cheated in any way, like leading up to it or or at the moment. Mm -hmm. well, when you first meet him, they make him out to be kind of sympathetic, possibly, but you're yeah. kind of like not sure. Yeah. And then the second time you meet him, you're like, this guy is a total yeah, fucking shitbag. Yeah, right, 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 right. I have made up yeah. my mind. Right. And by the time he's getting his, it's just like, oh, I can't wait. <laughs> right. And again, these are the things that I mean, I think that's what makes Alien such a great movie. I mean, you are you you are there experiencing this with the characters and a lot of that is being drawn in by these the different personalities I, and i i god i love that movie okay it goes awesome. without saying awesome. goes without saying all right Ooh. so one of the thoughts i had about you know like so when you write a story you want immersion right you want people to get into your story and you want them like you were saying you want them to hang in there you want them to be um, I'm captured by the story and you don't want them coming out of the story at all at any point in time, right? And, and for no, for no story. But do you think that horror stories need this more than other stories to, to be at their best effectiveness? Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. I, absolutely. I, yeah, absolutely. Cause I think, I think, I think the can... best horror stories are the ones that you you get to the end of it and you actually are really just tripping balls because you don't know if this character is going to live right or just how fucked up are they going to be if they survive it mm -hmm. and yeah. that's the only guy. way to do that is to make my hair right right and i think the two the thing too is the, it's like we said it's such a it's a genre that relies on on that visceral kind of effect and the moment someone is distracted and, and pulled out you're you're losing it mm -hmm. if you're not if you're not fully en ensconced in this in this book that you're reading in this universe in this world in these horrible or or you don't know if it's horrible yet but you have a feeling it's going to be and then something happens that pulls you out of that i mean it's it's not going to be effective right right all right. Uh, let's see. Ba, ba, ba. Paul, Paul and um, yeah. a lot of authors are good at this too. Like, there's a there's a, a character in the book who you either start out or develop a hatred for, but then you start to develop an understanding for, and even sometimes uh, you want you don't want them to die, you know, as much as you thought you did. Or then, and so I just I love when you know my mind is. <laughs> I love when my mind is played with by Paul. Um, oh, easy. And uh, yeah, uh, I assume the check is in the mail. It, there's consent. There's consent. Yeah, people, not... get, people get people paid good money for that, right? <laughs> and I might have inadvertently said "people gay," and that was not that was not Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> Just got tongue tied. 
Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> So no, it, that that's that's a really good a really good point. If you could build up the kind of character arcs, I, and that that's what keeps it from slipping into uh, uh, two dimensional vaudeville crap, yeah. where you got the mustachioed villain. Fuck that. Mm -hmm. If if you're gonna have that character, they have got to be relatable. They have got to have their own little mini arcs, so the characters can understand that, and it makes them so much more. It makes them so much more devastating with what they do or what they don't do or what happens to them or doesn't happen to them, depending on what the story is. So those fo those folks need good arcs too. He, you know, and, and I will say, mind rub. Rub. oh sorry, so so Dave, would, he's called it a mind rub. Yeah, yeah right. mind rub. So I will say this though, and 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 on uh, you know on the other side of that coin too, I think if you're gonna make a villain that is despicable, right? And that really has no redeeming qualities. I've you you got to go all in too. Yeah. You can't yeah. you can't pussyfoot around it. If they're the scum, if they're you know Carter Burke on a bad day, right? Right. <laughs> then you, then you have to go all in. And I think some of that is making it so you can't you can't relate to them, and it, you because you're so appalled. And I think that too is is engaging. And it's kind of going back to what we said earlier is. It's going to make you feel. You want to feel like, you know, it's the ridiculous person, you know, waxing their um, mustache. No, I'm you know, American like, psycho. Oh. Right, yeah. American well, yeah, psycho. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Holy and shit, right? <laughs> interesting because, you know, even uh, Hollywood's sort of coming around to helping um, the viewers of movies kind of develop an understanding of complex characters like the a good example is killmonger in black panther you know um we you know he's not he, he seems like on on the surface at all oh, he just is you know just killing for the sake of killing and he just wants to rule but no he's you you start to really feel for him at the end of the movie you don't want him to die you know yeah. maybe you know. Fuck yeah. <laughs> No, you didn't. Uh, well, look at, you know, look at, you know, you can look no, at characters no, like, um, all right. So this wasn't exactly a bad guy, but it's a guy that you were kind of, at least I was kind of hoping he would, you know, he would probably die or expect him to die. Was was in the fly, the one with, um, uh, Jeff Goldblum, right? Mm -hmm. The the boyfriend of of the the, the woman, <laughs> the, the the female person. So he's kind of a douche, and you're kind of like, ah, you know, like if he dies, he's I'd not be cool. kind of a douche. He's like a complete douche, right? But by the end of it, you're kind of you're kind of like you don't want him to die. You know, he's kind of like he sort of redeems himself in a way as a, as a maybe not a likable character, but like a character you or at least for me, I was kind of rooting for him at the end. I, I didn't really want him to die. Did, well, did you see the sequel? Yes, I did. Uh, yeah. Do you remember the conversation he has? Yeah, I didn't awesome. like your dad. He bugged me. Or yeah. whatever it was. It's like, fuck. <laughs> anyway, continue. No, he was still a douche. I mean, he's a douche, but I mean, it's like, I'm just saying, I, I didn't, by the end of the fly, I didn't particularly want him to die. Like, I kinda... No, because he was trying to help. He was yeah. actually trying to help. Yeah. Instead of just being an asshole. Right. Exactly, but he was an asshole. I mean, still was, douche, but yeah, still to douche. Help. Yeah, <laughs> hey, they have their purposes. Um, all right, so it, it it seems like it seems like most horror stories have one character <laughs> that serves as the catalyst for all the shit that goes down. You know, whether that's you know your curious scientist or your greedy corporate or whatever. Um, do 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 you think most horror stories require at least one idiot to set everything off on the rails? <laughs> 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 no, but it makes it a hell of a lot more fun that way. Yeah, I, I <laughs> Especially if poor idiot survives. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes it fun or you know Baby's um, day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it helps if there's someone, <laughs> some moron that you know, for whatever reason, whatever they're they're looking for power, you know, like in Hellraiser, you know, the guy trying to open Frank opening the box. Oh god. You know, yeah. or mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh or, or Paul Reiser's character again in Alien. Or the guys in the mummy. What's that? Or, yeah. uh, the mummy. Oh yeah, right, right. It's just, yeah. You you go back. There's there's always someone who sets it in motion to a certain degree, or at least the, not always. But the kinds of stories you're talking about, yes, there is somebody who sets this in motion. If you look at uh, Needful Things, it's Brian mm -hmm. Rusk. He's the first mm -hmm. boy who is the first customer who kicks off everything. Oh yeah. 
a thousand or what was it? 750 pages later, the book is over. I mean, he kicks that off and the rest of the book, you're sitting there going, Jesus Christ, man, how are you going to live with yourself? Right. And no comment. Anyway, the, uh, <laughs> That, I, that that poor idiot, you know, the, the poor folks who, who drill into M2 or uh, uh, happen to, you know, kind of be in the wrong place at the right of the wrong time on a, you know, space station called Crescent. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, there's yeah. always somebody who does something or some accident occurs or there's some idiot reading Latin in front of a book. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and good. I, and it, but it, it's but it works. You yeah, know, it it doesn't feel like it doesn't you know feel like, I mean you expect it you know you're like okay I think in some ways the, at least the we would identify like okay this is the fucker that is gonna ruin everything for everybody <laughs> and and I think you kind of have to do that right because like as the reader you tend to think of yourself as smarter than that like most of us are smarter mm -hmm. than that right we like we like, like to think so right exactly like, so you're like identifying we are not. We are not. We are not. Well, here's the thing. And any, you know, when my wife and I watch a scary movie and, and okay, they hear like a bang in the other room or they think they see someone walk by and they go and they go and the person goes and looks, you're like, why are you going into that room? What does it matter with you? I would never do that. And then I get to thinking about it. And then anytime I've heard weird sounds in our own home, of course, I've gone to investigate and I realize I'm like, I am that idiot. Right? I am that idiot. And, I right, am the idiot and, who's yeah, going to end I up with the idiot. machete between yeah. my eyes. Well, yeah. The only yeah. reason yeah. you yeah. think they're an idiot is because you're watching a horror movie and you know you're right. watching a horror movie. Right? They don't right. know they're watching a horror movie. Right. Yeah, they're living it. <laughs> right, right. I mean, if you want the rules for that, you you the, the you, you adhere to, to the rules the guy gives at the end of Scream. Yeah. The, the movie right. guy, right? Yeah. You yep. follow right. those rules. That is exactly the way horror movies work. Yeah. Absolutely. Slasher films in particular, but mm -hmm. it's still the way horror movies work to a certain degree. You have you have those things in there, and you we just kind of shuffle them shuffle them around as we yeah. like. Yeah. All right, just real quick because we're gonna I want to get to the game before we run out of time. Um, one of the questions was what just real quick what scares you like Phil what scares you what what is your what in real life gives you the heebie-jeebies? Ooh, well, you know, I mean, I was. Uh raised catholic uh and so but still sort of the demony stuff kind of gets yeah. to me you know so okay. uh, any any really well done um exorcism type film or book uh if done well because they can also be shit right. um <laughs> right. that stuff tends to tends to stick with me okay and paul what's what scares you Oh man, it could be that sock on the floor at 3 a.m. that looks like a some <laughs> animal that right. I I just can't identify, and it's probably not an animal because there are two cats that would kill any animal that was in there. But right. still, there's that sock looking at me, and it could be that other thing that's certain crawling up the bed and going to touch my foot in about two seconds. <laughs> that's what fucking scares me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, the only. I don't really, you know, I'm not, I don't believe in ghosts or anything like that. So that, that that stuff doesn't really scare me. If I hear a noise in the house, you know, I generally tend to think it's like the cat or the creaking wood or whatever, whatever. But I'll tell you, I get spooked sometimes when I'm walking the dogs out in the like out in the backyard mm -hmm. and it's really dark out, because there could be an animal like like some nasty animal, like because we you know Maybe we're as as Michael tell you, I live out in the sticks somewhat, not not completely in the <laughs> sticks, but kind of. Yeah, completely in the sticks. Yes, this area is called Hickory, and it fits. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And um, so, I, you know, there could be some animal I can't see that's nasty, or several. So that does creep me out a little bit when I hear like crunching, and I can't see what's what's out there. And the dogs are like, Ugh, and I'm just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh yeah, you two act tough, but I'm gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> you, like, oh, leash, you are gone <laughs> right right well, okay I mean, that's the other thing what, what what do you do when you when you walk and suddenly you see the cat just kind of like for no reason turn and stare at a wall right what the <laughs> hell are you looking at yeah, right. well, my my old apartment where we are convinced that it was that you believe it in ghosts or not there was something in that apartment and there were plenty of times where our dog would just like growl into the corner. And he does, that's not how he rolls. Right. And when he's growling, it's usually, it's, 
you know, he hears or sees something or, you know, I knock on the table because I'm an idiot and he barks, but uh, right. you know, he would he would just kind of stare like at places on the wall and just get his hackles all up. And that's on, you know, that's on the minimal of the stuff that happened in that place. But um, yeah, what do you do when the dog does that? You tell him to relax. There's nothing there. You, might, you, don't, you, you don't believe what you're saying to him, but you just want him to relax so you can feel remotely relaxed. Right. right. So you don't feel creeped out. Yeah. yeah. That's basically creeped out. For you. Even though at that point, it's way too late. You're, you're done. <laughs> you're sleeping with the lights on. All right. So we've got, we've got time for one more real quick. Mike, you want to ask this last question before we go to the game? I wanted to real quick before that just say, you know, shit that scares me. Maybe. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, what scares you, Mike? You count too, Mike. You count too. <laughs> sorry, buddy. Go on, Vampiric. Um, uh, what scares me is kind of like what Paul said in a way, though. It's like when you see something out of the corner of your eye and for a split second, even if it's a split second, it's a small, a very micro eternity that that thing is real. And you literally believe that, like, oh, my God, what the, oh, there's nothing there. Okay. Whew. Whew. Nothing there. Nothing there. That and when I run, when I come out of the basement with my laundry and I'm I'm walking or because I have to walk around the house we have an apartment uh-huh. we have to walk around to the basement so I'm walking outside and there are like you know this is a wooded area believe it or not in the city we back up against the university and there are um, deer and believe it or not like like I. I Deer can get, you know, I've seen, I've seen the, um, you know, the videos. They get, you know, city. These, these are, these are hood deer. You know, what I mean? deer. they're hard, hard deer. They're wearing they're... colors, man. They're represent. <laughs> yeah. It's a blood and crypt deer, and I just don't want to get hey, attacked. Hey, what well, you got, yeah, what you got in a basket? Those, man. <laughs> <laughs> you got that basket? All right. This last question. Uh, let me uh. think. <laughs> Let me make this sound so natural. Yeah, I've noticed that uh, you know both of you have themes that you uh, revisit. For example, uh, in uh, say your work, Phil, uh, <laughs> trees and dreams are prominent. Uh, what fuels uh, these themes in your work, and what other themes do um, you both like to play with? Just mm-hmm. I mean, right off the top of my head, oh, right off the top of your head, so, yeah. Like, you know, and I was thinking as, uh, as I might have received an email that that gave us some heads up to, to be a little prepared, and I was thinking, you know, the the tree theme, and I said, yeah, you know, there is, I kind of go back to the tree thing, um, but then you think of the trees in Harvey and the theme of the trees in that story, and then you look at how I, how trees kind of fit into into this growing story that is Eden. So now I'm working through the second part of Eden, which is ultimately going to be a four part series, right? I'm calling it each one is a cycle in my head. That's what I call it. Um, right. I don't know. Trees. I, 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 it actually goes back to a class that I took in uh, high school called call of the wild and was how nature and, and literature kind of intermingle and kind of being open and aware of nature as having this sort of just life force unto itself, not in sort of a like I like to, like hug trees kind of way and eating my trail mix and not wearing deodorant or that vibe, you know, that's my jam. But uh, <laughs> I there's something about trees in general and then the ancient trees and and there's a certain power to that certain vibe. Um, and so yeah, it inadvertently kind of became a theme for me. Uh, it was accidental, really. If I'm being a totally 100 percent honest. But the seed was there, not to, again, be throwing out puns or anything. But, um, but then another theme for me, too, and I think it comes from just the, the primal fear, but also I mean, my own fear is, is darkness. And I, and I know that's kind of a cheesy, shitty, silly kind of response there, but it's what you don't see. And I, 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 I find shadows to be, you know, there's a, there's a lot behind the shadows and, and that amongst everything for me as is is sort of the kind of recurring theme is is the shadows and what's in the shadows or the shadows itself as as sort of that dark kind of force so just that's the short answer because i could be talking here and it'll be like four in the morning guys are you there and then i'll get creeped out because you're sleeping and my right. door's gonna creep up yeah. or it's the darkness trying to push in here right anyway i digress <laughs> What were we talking about? <laughs> themes. What was the themes. question? Themes. Uh, themes. Well, themes. 
themes and or prominent, prominent types of uh, things do you deal with in your in your books? Like um, maybe there's just re- representation, like the, uh, maybe even like you know, like for, again for uh, Phil, it was trees. You know, is there something that sort of is a thematic throughout some of your books as far as like a symbolism? Hmm. Other than death and smelly I destruction, and dismemberment and things that smell. <laughs> Crackling bacon. <laughs> God. <clears throat> and sucks. You know, the, sc- the scary thing is, I, I think that uh, the scary thing is a horror podcast. I think readers are much better able to see that stuff for what it is than we are. At least I am. Somebody asked me if the black was a, was allegory for the oil industry and what it's doing to the planet. And I was like, Okay, that works. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. I, I wrote a I wrote a book. <laughs> it's got, Thank you. Yeah, I, it's got I, oil I, in it, right? It, it, sure, you it, go. No, it absolutely isn't. It's an allegory for death and doing things that we shouldn't be doing. It's actually it's an a, allegory for me on the toilet. Anyway, the the uh, oh, uh, weed. <laughs> I, I don't know if uh, it. I, I guess you could say that uh, probably alienation, isolation, and uh, uncanniness, and basically kind of taking reality and twisting it a bit. And you, you don't really have to twist all that much. You can. Um, that's all, all. Another reason why uh, psychotic and characters are so much fun to play with. Mm-hmm. Um, God, they're awesome. You can do some really neat shit with them. I, I guess those are the kinds of things that I like to deal with. Uh, you know, insanity, uh, something that you cannot really put your finger on that, that just does, defies description. And, I, of course, darkness, I think, plays a very big part in pretty much mm-hmm. 90% of my books. Right. So, uh, you know, draw your own conclusions from that. Right. Okay. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, guys... Thank you so much. But stick around. We're going to play a game. Everybody, check out Paul Cooley's stuff. You can find everything he does at shadowpublications.com. Find him on Twitter at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley. That's C-O-O-L-E-Y, just like it sounds. Facebook is uh, Paul Ellard Cooley. Uh, f- find Phil Rossi at patreon.com forward slash Phil Rossi. His name is right here on the window. You can see it right here. Um <laughs> Uh, it's clickable. You can also <laughs> find him at philrossimedia.com and make sure to check out his Twitch channel, twitch.tv forward slash, guess what, Phil Rossi Media. Uh, Twitter <laughs> at Phil Rossi and Instagram is Phil Rossi Media. I would also like to point out that uh, Mr. Cooley has his own uh, Patreon as well. Yes, he does. Right. That's right. I, I, do I think indeed. I give you money. I think I do. I think I support yeah, that. Yeah, you think you do. <laughs> and I'm also on Dev Robot Society, which okay, right. we... We'll, we've uh, that's got three episodes that haven't been uh, published yet because I've been a little busy. <laughs> hey, did did uh did our what happened to this week's black uh, black? Did it go up? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, good. <laughs> I, was, I was looking on my thing. Did I miss it? <laughs> it's no. Fine. Paul's busy. No. You're allowed to get on me when I don't get shit out on time, but don't do that to Paul. I'm not doing it. I'm just asking. I'm a fan. I'm, I'm asking. Paul's been my working God goddamn 15 episode hours. is no. So Paul Paul's not is is gonna get that done Friday. <laughs> That's fine. Very good. <laughs> All right, everybody. It is time to play a game. It, in fact, is game time with the Mythwits. I will be your game master. And this week, Mike, you're gonna love it. We're playing Rotten Rankings Horror Edition. <laughs> Look at the face. Oh here's, my God! Here, Set the bar fucking low. Here's here's Mike's <laughs> Mike's fear. This is this is what Mike is afraid of. <laughs> so what I've done is I've gone to Rotten Tomatoes and I looked up their hundred you know their their hundred ranked movies uh, for horror and these are basically um, based upon reviews. So it doesn't matter how good the movie is or how shitty it was or what. I, this is all based upon reviews. And what I'm looking for is. Pers- Percentage. So what I'm going to do is I am going to give each of you, and you're all going to get the same movie. I'm just going to write down what your answer is. Uh, you're going to get two movies, and then I'm going to you're going to tell me which one has a higher rating according to the Rotten Meter. Uh, I know it's just a guess, but it also gives people an opportunity <laughs> to see how these things get rated. So about uh, as unscientific a poll as it gets. Yes, yes, I I, I know, I know. <laughs> 
So, so go with your heart. That, well, some of this is give us a chance to go. Son of a bitch, that movie was better than that. You know, yeah, or whatever. Sure. All, right, yeah. All right. So let's go. Uh, we're going to start with Mike. I mean, I'll go around, but and we're all going to do the same movie. So there's seven movies, and we'll all get a chance to guess. Well, not we. I know the answers. But you all will get a chance. So, yeah. <laughs> so Mike, Phantasm, 1979, or 1985's Reanimator? Oh, Phantasm. I'm saying, which one had the higher yeah. rating? Which one do you think had the higher rating? Hmm. Phantasm or Reanimator? Yeah, uh, even though Paul wasn't supposed to say anything, even though I'm going to have to agree with him anyway, I'm going to go with Phantasm. All right, so Mike's going to go with Phantasm. Paul, you're going with Phantasm? Phantasm. Okay, and Phil, what do you think? I'm going Reanimator. Reanimator, all right. Hey, Phil. Yeah. Phantasm only pulled 73%. It was robbed. Reanimator got 93 Fantastic movie, not better than Phantasm. And I agree. However, I feel like there's more, like it's more trendy to be into, not trendy. It's because it's Lovecraft. That's what it is. Could be. Could be. (laughs) And it had more breasts. Yes. Yes. It It had more breasts. Who's going to argue with that? Who can? It's an 80s film, man. You had to have have the... Yes. The, Bumpity yep, bumps. Yep. yep. Like a movie with tits. What can <laughs> I tell you? Like a movie with tits. <laughs> All right. So, okay. Next one. Phil, I'm going to have you go first this time. Ooh, I'm going first on yep. this one. All right. I we are supposed to guess a percentage, but no, we're not, huh? No. Two th- okay. No, that's – no, I'm just comparing the two movies. So, right. 2002's The Ring or 1976's The Omen. I'm going to go with 1976's The Omen, although okay. I enjoyed both films. Great. All right. Paul? Omen. Paul goes Omen. Mike? Uh, I'm going to be a, uh, what is that called? A uh... bitch? No, sorry. <laughs> oh! Contrarian. <laughs> contrarian, you're going to go with the ring? A bitch contrarian, yes, okay. that's me. So, so Mike, you're the only one that got it wrong. Phil and Paul, you are correct. The Omen, 85%. The ring, only 71%. But I'll tell you, the ring was scary as shit. That was a creepy-ass yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah. The premise was stupid as shit. But... Oh, Ringu. Yeah. yeah. Ringu. 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 We're not supposed to be going for negative points here? Is that... No, we're not. No. All right. So... <laughs> All right, third one. All right, I misunderstood you. All right, all right. I, now I understand what I'm doing. Okay. okay. All right. So, so Paul, you're first. So, as I mentioned before, 2018's Mandy, or 1987's Hellraiser. Well, not having seen Mandy, uh, I'm gonna say is. Hellraiser. Hellraiser. Okay, Paul says Hellraiser. Uh, Mike. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, because I swore I wouldn't go with Paul again, I'm going to have to go with Mandy. Okay, Mike <laughs> says Mandy. All right, Phil? I'm going to have to say Hellraiser. Hellraiser. Oh, Mike? Though it doesn't feel right, but I'm going for it. Do you, oh. Hellraiser, I think all in all, Hellraiser is a better movie in that story, character development, all that kind of stuff. Mandy came in at 91%, Hellraiser 70 yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's Mandy was really good, but I yeah, love I Hellraiser. Know, I might have to watch that tonight. Then. Yeah, I love Hellraiser. Who am I shitting? I've got like four podcasts to work on tonight. Right. You can't watch anything. <laughs> I will not be watching anything other than my face hitting this uh, desk here in a few right. hours from now. All right. So I'll get through this real quick then. All right. So, uh, Mike, your first this one uh, Dawn of the Dead, 1979's Dawn of the Dead, or 2003's 28 Days Later. Oh, that's a good one. All right. Uh, Dawn of the Dead. I'm going to say, not in necessarily that I believe it per se, but uh, 28 Days Later probably has more votes. Okay. Uh, Phil? I'm going to have to say Dawn of the Dead. Because I know that it was kind of polarized with 28 Days Later and sort of the people were not universally down with the fast-moving zombies. So I'm going to say Dawn of the Dead. All right. Paul? I'm going to say it's a travesty, but I, too, am getting... Well, you know what? No, fuck that. <laughs> fuck that. We're going with a better film. Which one? Oh, I thought it was pretty fucking obvious. <laughs> it, it is. All right, He's it, going with the dead, Peter. Is, you're, going with, you're going with Dawn of the Dead? No. No. <laughs> All right. Sorry, 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 sorry. All right, so, Phil, you're correct. You're right. Uh... 
28 Days Later, in my opinion, is probably one of the top horror movies. I love it. I love it. Best zombie. It's, I know they're not zombie. Mm -hmm. Whatever. It's a zombie movie. Because, infected. Just right, call them infected. Whatever. It, it's, it's the best one of those movies, period, ever. In my in my opinion, you thought they were too fast until World War Z came out. Yeah, I hate that movie. All right, so Dawn of the Dead, ninety three percent. Twenty eight days later, eighty six percent. Okay, well, it was at least semi close. Yeah. The, 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 basically, Dawn of the Dead's iconic. Yes, that's what. That's why. I think that's why. Exactly. I think so. So wait, right. did I get a point out of that? I thought I, I got a point, right? I went with Dawn. I went with. Uh, you went with Dawn of the Dead. Did you go with Dawn? I'm sorry, Mike. I I apologize. I put you down the wrong. I went, I went twenty eight days later. You went 28 Days oh, Later, right. Okay, yeah, so you did... I said Dawn of the Dead is okay. a better movie, but 28 Days Later, I believe, is going to be. Right. Well, Dawn of the Dead got the points. So, no, you didn't get a point. Well, that's, that's bullshit. I know, it's a travesty. <laughs> I got you. So, all right, here we go. Evil Dead 1981, or oh, Evil God. Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. And Mike, I'm making oh. you go first, you bitch. <laughs> so easy it's so easy the second one all right so mike says D evil dead 2 all right uh paul god they're so equally awful i don't even know no no they're this. awesome <laughs> love them in two yeah. different, they diverge in their awfulness right oh they yes they do um you have to pick your favorite <laughs> the only reason i'm gonna say this is because again iconicness but there is something to it evil dead 2 I okay. think it's probably got better reviews. All right. And yeah. Phil? I'm going to agree. All right. Yeah. Hey, you all get a point. Evil Dead 2. 98% as opposed to 95% for Evil Dead. Although I got to say, Evil Dead really was a scary movie, I thought. It yeah. scared the shit out of me. I, I was terrified of how bad the acting was, the sound effects were, the <laughs> plot was, how many holes it had and everything else. And oh, my God. That really would have been fucking creepy if you did look like you'd stuck your finger into an electrical socket. <laughs> that wasn't scary. It was laughably pathetic. I, I was 17. I don't know. It scared me. All right. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was nine. But... Right, so, Paul, you're going to go first on this one because <laughs> it's 1982's The Thing versus 1980's The Shining. Oh, God. I'm sure The Shining is rated higher. Okay, Paul. The shinning. The shinning. All right, and uh, the shinning. let's do Phil. The Phil, the the I'm gonna say uh, the, shining. the shining. Okay, and Mike. Wait a minute. What is? It? What am I? Uh, the thing. Again? The thing the or thing. the shining. Thing or the shining. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say the sh the shinning. The shinning. All right, you're gonna go shining. out on a limb. Okay, they were really close. You all got it right. The Shining did. It beat it out 85 to 84. Ooh, yeah. Personally, yeah, I okay. enjoy The Thing better. I think they're both fantastic movies, but I think The Thing is a more enjoyable movie. Like, I'd want to watch The Thing over and over again, whereas The Shining, I can watch it once in a great while. I don't know. That's Next. <laughs> What's that? No, you don't think so, Paul? No, I, 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 I've seen The Thing probably 35 40 times i've seen the shining maybe four right that's what um, i'm saying it's a good it's a great movie yeah. but i just enjoy the sh the thing better like it just from a pure chewing satisfaction you know what i mean <laughs> it's a movie you just kind of like yeah. oh yeah we're at that part i want i want to watch this you know, yeah. i want to see yeah. windows completely freak out here because it's so good yeah, yeah. It, it's that kind of film yeah. it's that kind of film the shining is not that kind of film no all right. You know, you can buy the carpet. So somebody's selling like the carpet from the hotel. I didn't know that was a thing. You know, that's a whole thing. Look it up sometime and you get a chance. The carpet mm -hmm. in The Shining. There's a there's a whole fucking thing about it that Kubrick did, and it's a whole video on it. Anyway, huh. all, right. all right. Last one, and, and Phil, you're gonna go first on this one. All right. All right. Nineteen. This is this is the bitch. 1975's Jaws or 1979's Alien. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. Damn. Right? All right. I'm, I will I'm tell you going... this. They are literally one point apart. Oh, shice. Um, <laughs> damn. My my heart is telling me alien. My mind, my logic is, is going to say Jaws eked it out by a point. So Jaws it is? Okay, Phil. All right. Yeah. Uh, 
Mike, since I started with you, I'll let you go last. Paul, Jaws or Alien? I'll bet Jaws is rated higher. Okay, Paul says Jaws. Mike? As much as I want to contrary or at least game theory my way out of this, <laughs> I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote not party lines, but I'm going to vote my, my brain as well and say Jaws will leak it out. Yes, Jaws does. It's very uh, – both super fantastic movies. It, both scores are it. valid. 98 uh, versus 97. Yeah. All right, which which were like some of the highest scores. Now, the, the number one and number two movies were both Jordan Peele movies, the the Us and um, – what's that other one that he did? The uh, – oh, shit. Uh, get Out. Let get out. out. Yeah, Get Out yeah, and get Us out. were the two top. I haven't seen either of them, to be honest. And, I don't know. I'm just having a, like, is that a popularity thing or something? I mean, they were good, but goddamn, they beat out Jaws and Alien and, and, and all these other ones. And Were they that much better horror movies? I'm I surprised. I haven't seen them. Like Saw. Yeah. Saw wasn't on the list. What? Wasn't on the list. Interesting. Right, where, so. where do you guys get on? Where do you guys like on Saul? <laughs> Not on the sharp side. Oh! <laughs> Bling, ding. Um... You know, I was never really super into the the Saw movies. Uh, just that's not, I mean, not my thing. I prefer the more of the psychological horror. Mm -hmm. Not that that's it's not torture to say, porn. Well, yeah, well, exactly. Not to say I don't like seeing someone get their arm, you know, lopped off, but I I like some build up to that. You know, that's... I I did like the first Saw. I'll have to yeah. say I thought the first <laughs> Saw was was the best of the bunch. Because it's it... been so long, I gotta I gotta go yeah. back. And... Yeah. Revisit that. Like but, the first two were almost the same movie, sort of right. a and slash what happens next. The first ten are all the same. <laughs> no. <laughs> all right, no. hey, no. hold on, we got some business to do here. Uh, right. Mike and Paul, you tied with four. Phil, six points. Damn, you did good. Phil is our winner. It's because I voted with my hat instead of my brain. <laughs> There we go. Nice. There's your award. <laughs> there you go. Bring your own award. That's the punishment. Yeah, I, right. yeah, I really, oh, I really want to be on like a it. show that hands out sex toys as an award because, uh, wow, well, that looked just wrong. Well, you know, if you if you go to our live Balticon show, I might be able to make that happen, Paul. Uh, okay. <laughs> Paul's always Never there. Never again. No, I've seen Mike eat a bag of dicks, and then I've seen him almost pass out from heat exhaustion over peppers. I'm done. Yeah. You're never gonna top it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I got something planned for this year. I ain't telling. What? I ain't telling. Huh? I got something planned. Me and Tori. I to know. Nope. Tori and I are working it. <laughs> gonna be a surprise. Oh no. Gonna be a surprise. I got bad news. Paul. I can't make Balticon. Hey Paul, you, yeah. you make, gotta make see this one. Make sure you show up that night. It's gonna be good. <laughs> gonna be real good. <laughs> anyway, hey, guess what? It's that time. Thanks everybody. Uh, thanks you guys for yeah. showing up. Um, uh, Phil's got shit to do. I'm sure Paul's got shit to do too. He's got a Friday episode. He's got to work on. <clears throat> so go to. <laughs> go to I got I got about a couple thousand lines of code to write before Thursday. Oh, all right. So go to shadowpublications.com. Check out Paul. Dash E underscore E underscore Cooley on Twitter and Paul L. Cooley on Facebook and check out his Patreon forward slash Paul E. Cooley. Phil Rossi is at patreon.com forward slash Phil Rossi, Phil Rossi Media.com, twitch.tv forward slash Phil Rossi Media, Twitter Phil Rossi, and Instagram Phil Rossi Media. Uh, let's. I'm so exposed. There you go. <laughs> you I have, I have too, many, too many places. Too many places. You're everywhere. All right, everybody, you've just enjoyed another awesome episode of The Mythwits. Hey, and guess what? Happy uh, happy Halloween for everyone, if, uh, if you're listening happy to this Halloween. on that day. Uh, yeah. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. And make sure to share your favorite videos, our favorite episodes on social media to help spread Mythwits love and disgusting bits over the entire planet. Tweet us at Mythwits and check out Mythwits.com. Mythwits is a TSR Podcast Network production. Check out TSRPN.com for more cool shows like Game School, the show where they interview designers about their tabletop RPG, deep dive into the mechanics, make a character, and play a short demo of the game to see it in real time. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like a shirt in all the places. Just don't edit, don't change it, and don't use it to dredge up the purest oil anyone has ever seen. You're likely to hear clickety, clickety, 
click of little black talons. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week, Mike? Two things. First, happy birthday to the love of my life, no, Jenny God. Lynn. It's her birthday today. Secondly, my favorite line from any uh, movie, um, Christine, horror movie, from Christine, when the cop says, are you aware that one of the assailants defecated on your dashboard? And he said, shit wipes off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, good night. <laughs> <laughs>